I'm your host, Annie Bowles, and this is News Du Jour. Hey, you guys, and welcome back to the News Du Jour, a calmer space to consume the news. So today we have too many stories here for you guys at the top. One's really a correction that I wanted to issue, something I wanted to clarify. And then we have a smaller story about the journey to find the new Speaker of the House. And then the rest of the episode will be Israel updates as so much has happened over the weekend. It was just nonstop. And if you don't already follow us on Instagram, our Instagram is at newsdujour.podcast. And that is where you can get the most pressing updates. We are all constantly updating our stories with the most breaking news, but then we'll go into all of the backstory here on the podcast. So buckle up. It is going to be quite the episode. But real quickly before we jump in, I wanted to remind you guys that our show is made possible by Liquid IV. Liquid IV is the hydration multiplier. Basically, it's a little packet of powder that you mix into your water. I like to mix it into a whole Stanley cup. That is how I like to do it because it is a little bit too concentrated for me and just like the amount recommended. I probably double it. But I love the way that it makes my water taste. It makes it more drinkable to me. And then not only that, but inside your body, it is going to make your water go further, basically, and help you get rehydrated more quickly. So if you're doing any sort of activity that dehydrates you, like drinking, traveling, working out, if you're doing anything like that, or if you've been sick for whatever reason, your body needs that hydration. And so Liquid IV is just going to help you refuel even faster. Liquid IV has actually been recommended to me by a nutritionist as well as several doctors of mine. It is definitely something that is going to improve your health overall. It delivers five essential vitamins also while it's hydrating you. So it's almost like taking a multivitamin while you're drinking water. So it's really the best of all worlds. And I never travel without them. You can get 20% off if you just wanted to try it with our code DUJOUR. That's D-U-J-O-U-R. And that's again, 20% off. And there's a link in our show notes. Thank you guys so much. And when you support our sponsors, you support our show. As you already know, we'll go ahead and start off with our correction. As I've mentioned before, I never bury a correction in the fine print or anywhere where it's not super visible. I want you guys to have the correct information no matter what. So I had read that Hamas was a poor organization, and that is how a lot of commentary commentary online portrays it. But I found out that that is definitely not the case. As per Forbes magazine, the Arab Weekly, CNN, and more, Hamas is worth billions. And that is something that we will discuss later in the episode because it plays a huge role in how the Palestinian people have been mistreated, what Israel is really up against, and really what the world is facing when it comes to autocrats teaming up. For our second mini story, I wanted to let you guys know that a police officer has been convicted in the case of the murder of Elijah McLean. I know a lot of you guys, like me, were deeply invested in this particular case. A second officer, though, was acquitted. I wanted to let you guys know. Basically, even though they were tried together, the officer who was convicted was the superior officer and the jury determined that he was the one who was really at fault and not his inferior officers. So that's it for mini stories today. We are going to go ahead and jump into the search for the Speaker of the House. So I wanted to touch on the search for the speaker before we headed into our Israel updates because honestly, this search is going long and could really affect our ability to help our allies. Let's jump in. 
So the search for the Speaker of the House continues. Steve Scalise, who we discussed on Friday, who was nominated, he did not stand up to the vote. He lost the vote. Of course, now Jim Jordan looks like the front runner. Austin Scott's name has also been tossed around. There have also been rumblings about Mike Johnson of Louisiana seeking the gavel should Jim Jordan secure, fail to secure the votes. But this is why ousting McCarthy made absolutely no sense. It will be difficult to elect any Speaker of the House right now. And that is because of how divided the Republican Party is. There aren't any strong leaders. The moderate Republicans are the majority, but they're kind of being held hostage by the Trumpian minority members whose votes they need to put someone into the position. It really, again, points back to that lack of leadership right now in the Republican Party. Generally, they don't agree on anyone. And until they do, our government literally cannot function. At the end of the day, it would be phenomenal to have a cool head in this position. Right now, things are extremely precarious in our world. We need our most serious and rational leaders leading with steady hands and strong hearts. No more political scorekeeping or game playing. We have the world looking to us to lead towards fairness and stability right now. We have some serious work to do, and we need serious leaders to do it. And now without further ado, we will go ahead and jump into Israel updates. So this is going to be long. Go ahead and buckle up. Our episode might go long for the day, but the first thing I want to talk about is a ground invasion. So a ground invasion is imminent, and that is the biggest thing to know and be aware of right now. Israel plans to invade Gaza, and they have said that in no uncertain terms. Their goal to rid the world of Hamas, both their political and militant fractions. Doing this will be no small feat. A lot of civilians, especially children, stand in the way. That said, the Daily Mail published that the IDF elite forces, kind of like Israel's SEAL team, has actually recovered 250 hostages, which is more than we even knew were taken, although There are many more that are still missing. Um, They've killed 60 Hamas militants and captured a top Hamas leader. Not the top, but one of the top like kind of militant leaders. This is what the Daily Mail is reporting. Again, just as a reminder, as we go into this episode, in case you've missed some of the previous ones, there is so much mis and disinformation floating around right now more than ever, especially about this issue. So I am wading through it as much as I can, and I will always cite where I got information and always issue corrections at the top of each episode. So it's just really important to, you know, listen to where information is coming from now more than ever to be media literate. Anywho, um, it's un- unclear what recovering these hostages really means, quote unquote. I don't know if these hostages were alive or dead. But the biggest atrocity that has happened since we spoke is the Israeli government telling one million people, residents of northern Gaza, a million people to move (laughs) to the southern half of Gaza. This is literally inconceivable. It is impossible for so many reasons. You know, what about people who are hooked up to a ventilator right now because they were just bombed? What about people who are without a vehicle or means of travel? What about babies who depend on formula? And where are people supposed to eat, sleep, and for lack of a better term, shit when they get down to southern Gaza, which is already overcrowded and lacking in infrastructure? The UN straight up came out and said, this cannot happen, guys. It is a true recipe for an outright disaster. But the world watched over the weekend as the Israeli government sent paper floating down from the sky, instructing innocent Palestinian people to leave their homes and legit run for their lives. Since then, fortunately, I woke up on Sunday to read that the Israeli government is now coordinating safe evacuations, quote unquote, for Palestinians. So we do not have many specifics here, 
But I think they are starting to understand that they are responsible for helping these innocents get out of the way or at least giving them an opportunity to evacuate. I hope so. Even as Hamas fires more rockets at Israel from Gaza, they're still trying to help. And it doesn't mean that everyone will be safe. Far from it. But if one more child is safe from this measure of them helping to get Gazans out, it is a godsend and it's a good thing. I think many will be safer from these efforts. Now, it is important to remember that Gaza is not solely surrounded by Israel. They also share a border with a fellow Arab country, Egypt, directly to the south where they are being told to flee towards. So... As of the time I'm recording this, Egypt is not planning to open their border to let Gazans into Egypt. Why? First off, they don't want Hamas in their country either, let's be real. And they are not prepared to host the millions that would seek refuge there as refugees. The main crossing into Egypt is called the Rafah crossing. That's spelled R-A-F-A-H. So if you see that in the news, what they're talking about is the place where Palestinians who live in Gaza would theoretically evacuate into Egypt, the Rafah crossing. So that is only if Egypt decides to open their border, which again, as of now, they haven't done. But reportedly, Hamas according to NBC News, as well as many other outlets, are urging Palestinians not to leave Gaza, not even northern Gaza. They want them to stay there and be killed. We understand that Hamas's ideology is such that, much like suicide bombers around the Arab world, that if you are killed in pursuit of a free Palestine, then you are to be rewarded by God in heaven. I know. It's deplorable, but that is what they preach to innocent people, including children. So speaking of Hamas, what would getting rid of Hamas really look like? What would that require? Well, it won't be quick and it won't be easy. Smoking them out of Gaza even, that tiny little strip of land, will require an invasion of the area and a ton of intelligence work. But that doesn't even account for the Hamas leadership that is pulling the strings from abroad. They will be much harder to find and much better protected. And speaking of, let's circle back to an important piece of this puzzle, the vast wealth of Hamas. At the top of the episode, I said this was going to be an important piece, right? And it is. Gaza is poor. Palestinian individuals living in Gaza are poor. But Hamas... They are not poor. Far from it. According to Forbes magazine, Hamas is one of the 10 richest terrorist organizations in the world, and they see an annual turnover of approximately $1 billion. That is their turnover. They're actually worth about $2 billion. So if you hear that Palestinians don't have an army or that they are poor as a country, well, their government, quote unquote, Hamas, isn't. And they definitely have an army. You can see photos online of hundreds, if not thousands, of Hamas militants lined up in their black uniforms and armed. Now, are they any match for Israel, backed up by the U.S. and the rest of the Western world? Not a chance. But Palestinians elected Hamas back in 2006, 2007, and they do have an army and they do have lots of cash. They just use that cash to terrorize Israelis not to help their own people who are literally living without a reliable sewer system. Yeah, that is what we're dealing with here. Antony Blinken even said that the bloodthirsty nature of Hamas reminded him of, quote, the worst of ISIS, end quote. And he is someone who has had up close and personal experience facing off with ISIS. But Hamas is not the only leadership who is being criticized here. No, no, no. Netanyahu's own people have picked up protesting him yet again. Yes, in the middle of all this, he does not even have the support of the Israeli people to be leveling whole neighborhoods in Gaza. From what I understand, at the heart of the Jewish religion is thou shall not kill. 
Jews believe in preserving human life, and that's at the core of who they are. And they are not seeing that reflected in Netanyahu's destruction of the Palestinian people, especially children. And they're not helpless to stop it. They are taking to the streets to protest his actions as they have done before. According to reporting by Business Insider, the protesters are calling for Netanyahu's resignation over his response to the Hamas attack. They hold signs splattered with red paint saying, quote, Bibi, there is blood on your hands, end quote. According to Business Insider, he has yet to even reach out to the families whose loved ones have been taken hostage by Hamas, according, again, to Business Insider. Unimaginable. Biden reportedly spent 90 minutes on the phone with American hostage families, and only 14 of them have been taken. That is the least that a leader can do in a situation like this. Public opinion polls, though, here in the U.S. are being conducted, and it seems that American citizens support Israel and its efforts to end Hamas, and two-thirds of people reported feeling worried that the rise of Hamas could lead to terrorist attacks on U.S. soil. That said, the poll also reflected that 47% said they at least moderately trusted Biden at the helm. So his numbers aren't great, but they're up from the 42% that he had at the start of the war with Ukraine, according to CNN Politics. It sounds like many people are worried that the global ramifications here are pretty dire. And to be honest, we should be worried. There are several developments on that front that I think are very important we go over, specifically four. Let's jump in. So number one, the most alarming development on that front, the sort of global perspective here from this weekend, was the video footage coming out showing the leader of Hamas, a founding member, meeting with the leadership of Iran. The two met up in Qatar, where the Hamas leader is supposed to be living, And Reuters confirmed that the purpose of the get together was to continue their relationship. Absolutely spine chilling to have photographic evidence of a linkage between these recent attacks and Iran. Iran is obviously a sworn enemy of the United States. They have required children in school to chant death to America and death to Israel every morning. They are not friendly. What's more, if you guys remember, we covered this extensively and even have a whole bonus episode about it with an Iranian attorney named Ella Kalaban. They have inflicted on their own people some of the most deplorable human rights abuses ever documented. After the meeting, the two announced they had agreed to, quote, continue cooperation, end quote, and called the attack on Israel a, quote, historic victory, end quote. I really could be sick from that. What did they gain in that attack other than terror and bloodshed? The second most alarming development from the global community is that Iran has warned Israel that they will escalate their involvement in the conflict if Israel Israel continues its offensive against Gaza and attempts to root out Hamas, which they plan to do. So we've said it before. If Iran gets directly involved with this conflict, it could lead to a world war. That looks very much like a World War III beginning. Bloomberg reported that the Saudis have put their diplomatic deal with Israel on hold in the wake of the current violence, which is super troubling. Obviously, it was a precarious deal to begin with, but the whole reason that the U.S. was trying to help broker this deal was to secure that the Saudis would be on the side of the allies should a a world war commence involving like Russia and China. Now, it looks like we are even closer to a world war, but further from having the Saudis on our side. And lastly, in terms of global ramifications, on the Zoom call that I watched, hosted by Columbia University, Hillary Clinton, former Secretary of State who has worked with Netanyahu personally, cited Putin's statement on this conflict as particularly noteworthy and spine-chilling. His statement read in part that he stands, quote, ready to work constructively with all like-minded partners, end quote. Yeah. That just 
If that doesn't send shivers down your spine, I honestly don't know what would. Again, this is what we're seeing is autocrats uniting. These leaders who are so corrupt and abuse their own people coming together to fight democracies. To me, the only word to describe this moment is precarious, delicate, dangerous, dicey, hovering on the edge where a strong wind might blow us one way or the other as a global community. It makes me think of what the moments just before Pearl Harbor must have been like, watching the world around us, our allies, descend into the chaos and suffering and hellscape that is war. Just us waiting for a sign, a white flag of peace to float over us and ease our fears, or a red flag of war to usher us into the madness. I personally am saying prayers constantly for two things. Number one, that not another hair on another head is harmed, that the bloodshed can end. And number two, that both nations find true leadership that bring them together in mutual respect, love, safety, and brotherhood, and that those who stand against those things are silenced once and for all. We have added links in our show notes for aid organizations that can help both Palestinians and Israelis and really encourage you guys to consider making a donation. And that is the news du jour. Today, I wanted to leave you guys with a quote. It's really a wonder that I haven't dropped all my ideals because they seem so absurd and impossible to carry out. Yet I keep them because in spite of everything, I still believe that people are really good at heart, and I simply can't build my hopes on a foundation of confusion, misery, and death. I see the world gradually being turned into a wilderness. I hear the approaching thunder. I can feel the shuddering of millions. And yet, if I look up to the heavens, I think that all will come out right one of these days, that this cruelty will end, and that peace and tranquility will return. And those are the words of 16-year-old Anne Frank. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on whatever podcast platform you use to listen. A rate and review on that platform or a shout out on social media would mean the world to us and help us to be able to keep creating the news du jour and reach more people who need a calmer space to consume the news. But the best way to support all of our work is to become a patron at www.patreon.com forward slash sugar free media. And that is also linked in our show notes. You can follow us on social media at news du jour dot podcast on both Instagram and TikTok. You can follow my personal account at it's Annie Bowles on both platforms as well. Any little noises you may hear in the background are my rescue pup. He has a little separation anxiety and always records with me. We appreciate you listening and look forward to telling you about the news again next time on News Du Jour. Broadcasting from Oklahoma. Oklahoma.